Dr. Vieira has uh, got four degrees from Harvard, two doctorates, one in a law degree and the other a PhD in chemistry. Uh, he has uh, taught at uh, Wake Forest Law School, professor. Uh, he's argued a dozen cases before the U.S. Supreme Court, and he's really the nation, maybe the world's eminent scholar on the topics that we're discussing tonight. After his uh, talk in Nashville, I bought his books, uh, Pieces of Age, Volume 1 and 2, and it's an exhaustive uh, compendium of all the topics and issues related to what he'll be addressing. I haven't, I wish I could say I'd read it, but I have studied it, particularly the history part. So we're really honored to have him with us here tonight, Dr. Edwin Vieira. Reasons America 
Americans cannot simply abolish the Federal Reserve System at one stroke. You often hear people say, well, it would be a good idea to get rid of the Federal Reserve System. Unfortunately, that would simply raise in another form the key question that I asked previously. If the Federal Reserve System ceases to exist, then exactly what will the United States, the states, and American citizens use as currency? And once again, we don't have an answer to that question. Second, whatever is done must be done gradually so as to allow the free market to adjust prices to this new currency. Third, America does not want to abolish the Federal Reserve System root and branch. Rather, it should be kept afloat as long as possible until the lifeboats are ready. Yet at the same time, we need to provide and put into operation an alternative to the system and then allow competition among these currencies to cause the necessary adjustments to be made in the market as they need to be made. Now, when I talk about alternative currency, I mean exactly that. An alternative to not an immediate substitute for Federal Reserve notes. The adoption of an alternative currency by one or more states would in no way prevent the Federal Reserve System from continuing to function and the general government, Governor Washington, D.C., and other states continue to employ Federal Reserve notes as their currency if they wanted to and so long as the Federal Reserve System remained viable. All right, what can be done then politically? Well, there are a number of alternatives here, possibilities. First of all, I call the English alternative. Wait for something to turn up and then muddle through. Well, we can't simply wait for a monetary crisis to shock people and politicians into the realization that gold and silver must be reintroduced as official media and exchange. First, in a regime of near fiat currency, such as exists under the Federal Reserve System, a monetary crisis, a real breakdown, a hyperinflationary event, if you will, can occur at almost any time. And if it truly merits the name crisis, it will occur just when the country is least prepared for it, economically, politically, and psychologically. Second, a monetary crisis will create a set of circumstances that are not very conducive to calm or rational economic or political thinking. Rather, it will tend to generate hysteria, hopelessness, depression, and demagoguery. People and politicians will be desperate to discover some quick and easy escape from waves of bank failures, bankruptcies, foreclosures, mass unemployment, and collapses in tax revenues. Public officials and politicians will be eager to finger some scapegoats, other than themselves, of course, on whom to pin the blame for the crisis, thus generating further political and social conflict and chaos. They'll start to advocate extremist panaceas and assume unlimited so-called emergency powers in which many people probably will acquiesce. And desperate Americans may even accept personal sacrifices of their property, orders of magnitude greater than would have been required to institute a system of sound money in time to avert the crisis in the first place. And of course, everyone will end up suffering losses of liberty that are not only unnecessary to achieve monetary stability, but are also designed to prevent sound money from ever being restored. Well, the next alternative is to wait for action by Congress. I won't talk about that because I think anyone who relies on that possibility is certifiably delusional. That is not going to happen. Then again, we might wait for action by some outsiders, as for instance, the International Monetary Fund, because they've been talking certainly about introducing some new supranational global currency along the lines of what they call their special drawing rights. Now, the problem here is the introduction of new currency to the outside would, of course, take time. You have to have multinational political agreements. You have to have a method for introduction of a new currency into the economy of all the different countries that will use it. You certainly have to have a method for the removal, or at least the downgrading of the Federal Reserve System in its present capacity as the source of a world's major reserve currency, because it would no longer perform that function. And then you'd need market adjustments, of course, to restore some measure of economic equilibrium. But, to my mind, the more serious criticism of this possibility is that even if it were economically effective, and it could be done in a timely fashion, the introduction of some new global currency would shift political sovereignty from the United States to some foreign supranational institution such as the IMF or perhaps the United Nations. I don't think uh, uh, any serious uh, patriot uh, would want that result. Well, then the next possibility is to depend upon action by individuals, essentially through the free market. Unfortunately, Americans can't solve 
this problem as individuals by the simple expedient of themselves adopting silver and gold as preferred medium of exchange. Now, such actions can provide a measure of self-protection against monetary instability for the individuals here and there that may engage in them. But for genuine monetary reform to occur, whatever is done must operate both extensively and comprehensively. That is, it must involve in the process a large number of people within a significant geographical area and affect a substantial portion of the economy in that area. For that reason, Whatever the reform is, it has to be directed, systematic, and institutionalized rather than dependent upon uncoordinated efforts of individuals, many of whom will be unaware of and unable to cooperate with each other. Moreover, the chosen method must be economically viable from the very, very onset. If even a sound plan for reform is too complicated or too costly to implement in its initial stages, well, nothing, of course, will be done. And in the nature of things, consideration of cost alone excludes reliance on merely individual efforts. I don't know how many people are aware of this, but although from 1933 Americans were denied the right to own gold because that right was restored in 1973 and 74, and although from 1933 Americans were denied the right to make contracts payable in gold, or a particular kind of coin or currency measured in gold, what came to be called gold clause contracts, that right was restored in 1978. Furthermore, a gold clause contract today is not subject to the legal tender law, so that law doesn't constrain people in terms of making such contracts. So those contracts can be made, and they would certainly serve the interest of every American who made them. And if sufficiently widespread in use, they would effectively demonetize Federal Reserve notes in favor of gold and silver so alternative currency would come into play automatically. Nonetheless, since 1978, when they were re-legalized again, gold clause contracts, as far as I've been able to tell, have played next to no role in the free market anywhere in the United States. And this is because the expense of making such contracts adds to the normal cost of doing business, and of course that precludes the use of those contracts. And I could go into a long analysis of what the economists call uh, transaction costs, uh, costs of getting the information, uh, cost of making the kind of contract, cost of dealing with lawyers, accountants, cost of regulatory costs that are involved because contracts that are made payable in silver and gold are treated for tax purposes in a different way than contracts that are made payable in, in Federal Reserve notes. So you have a, a, an overhang, as it were, of costs that prevents this type of arrangement from being made and therefore reform coming through individual action. Well, that brings me to the last possibility, which is action by the states. Rather than realistically, unrealistically, excuse me, hoping that individuals will solve this problem, or waiting simply for a monetary crisis to occur, we really need to look to the one entity that is capable of dealing with the problem. And the way to identify that entity is really to look at the mechanism that we have to put into play. The mechanism that needs to be put into operation to bring about an alternative currency. First, the mechanism must provide for a gradual reform, one that can be thought through and put into place, tested, perfected, publicized, while everyone is thinking calmly and clearly, that is, before a serious crisis breaks out. Also, this reform needs to be introduced as widespread a matter as practicable. Because where fundamental monetary change is concerned, small is not beautiful. And that's because no small enclave, no matter how apparently isolated, will be immune from the adverse effects of a nationwide monetary crisis. Neither can such an enclave's success in protecting itself hope to have significant economic effects elsewhere, nor can success in some small enclave really test the system to show that it's applicable in other places. So from the very beginning, monetary reform must involve an entity that is a significant participant in the market in that it takes in and pays out large amounts of purchasing power in whatever currency it employs. It must be an entity that operates throughout a significant geographical area and that interacts with a relatively complex economy. It must be an entity that enjoys some measure of legal immunity from interference with monetary reform by the government in Washington and the Federal Reserve System for the very success of the reform will make it a target of such interference. Especially because the Federal Reserve System and the political and economic special interest groups behind it 
do not want America to return to gold and silver as official currency. And they will take whatever measures they can get away with in order to stop that from happening. Well, the only entity that fits this description, other than perhaps the government of Washington, D.C., Congress, is the state for the following reasons. First, permanence, legally, operational, and geographically. Every state is an integral part of the Constitution's federal system. No state is going to go out of business in the near future or move to some other location. Secondly, economic size and significance. A typical state's governmental budget and private economy are large enough that a reform in any one state will have a significant impact and provide a meaningful example of what can be accomplished in other states. Taxation and spending create a steady state flow of purchasing power into and out of a state's treasury. And the amounts of purchasing power taken into and paid out through the treasury are always significant in terms of the percentage of the total monetary transaction within the state's territory. That is, the state is a big player, as it were, in its own economy. And very large numbers, if not most people resident in a state, are taxpayers or recipients of governmental payments one way or the other or both. So whatever currency the state chooses to adopt will immediately affect a significant portion of her population. Then thirdly, political credibility. Unlike Congress, unlike any administration of recent vintage, and certainly unlike the Federal Reserve System, the states retain at least residual political credibility among average Americans. Fourth, political reliability and accountability. The states retain political credibility because average Americans continue to believe that their state governments truly represent or can be made to represent them, not just the special interest groups who are influential in Washington. If not all states, then certainly most states are entities that their citizens can actually control by educating, organizing, mobilizing key legislative leaders, or if necessary, changing the composition of the legislature. Then there's political responsibility. In America's federal system, the states retain the primary, and I would suggest the ultimate responsibility for their own people's safety and welfare. And that responsibility resides in the state's legislature and cannot be delegated, let alone surrendered, to anyone else. Sixth, legal competence. This is very important. The states possess the unquestionable legal and particularly constitutional authority to act in this situation. I'll get into this in more detail. The Constitution's federal system allows, empowers, and encourages state legislatures within very broad limits to experiment with economic laws in the effort to achieve socially desirable results. And specifically with respect to currency, the Constitution reserves to the states important sovereign powers which they may exercise independently of and without interference by the general government and the Federal Reserve System. We emphasize that. They may exercise those powers independently of and without interference by the general government and the Federal Reserve System. Seventh, multiplicity. What I mean here is that any reform works through the states has 50 chances for success, not simply one chance as we would have in Congress. And what, of course, succeeds in one state can rapidly be adopted in other states. And then finally, national visibility and effect. The first state to adopt an alternative currency will be a model for others. And that kind of action can't remain unnoticed. It cannot be without an immediate political and economic effect. Well, what is the specific action then that ought to be taken by the state? That really has three parts. First, adopt a new currency unit, or units actually, of gold and silver. Secondly, make this currency an official currency of the state, along with Federal Reserve notes, with the ultimate intent of gradually replacing Federal Reserve notes to the extent that becomes necessary and practicable. And third, minimize the transaction costs for the average citizen who will want to use this new currency by creating a state depository or like institution to safeguard the currency and enable transfers to be effected, educating the state citizens about the existence of this system, providing means for the citizens to use the new currency in their dealings with the state, particularly in the area of taxation and governmental spending, promoting and facilitating the use of the new currency by the citizens of the state in their private economic transactions, and negotiating appropriate arrangements with the government of Washington, whereby the state citizens can employ the alternative currencies in dealing with that government, such as with respect to taxes, so as to minimize as much as possible the regulatory costs impinging on this system. Well, now, 
have a question and it becomes, all right, but you can do all those things, that's fine. The practical matter, what about the state's constitutional authority to adopt an alternative currency? Well, the first thing we have to remember is that the federal government is not simply the government in Washington, D.C. As the Tenth Amendment makes clear, it consists of that government plus the 50 states plus the people among all of which governmental power is distributed and decentralized. Some powers have been delegated to the United States, some powers have been prohibited to the states, but other powers have been reserved to the states. And yet other powers have been reserved to the people, including ultimately the power to change the whole form of government under the principles of the Declaration of Independence. Now this matter is covered in uh, what I would call excruciating detail in a little paper I prepared called an introductory primer on the constitutional authority of the states to adopt an alternative currency. And I think Aaron Bollinger can make that available to those people who are not uh, enough to want to read it. <laughs> it's all there with, uh, with footnotes to statutes and Supreme Court cases and constitutional provisions. But let me go over the, the basic principles. There are five of them. Each and every state, for herself and her citizens, is constitutionally as well as in some particular statutorily authorized one, to adopt gold and silver coins as an alternative currency. Number two, to adopt what I call electronic gold or electronic silver, and I'll cover that the meaning of that later as an alternative currency. Number three, to avoid the use of whatever the government in Washington has designated legal tender to whatever degree that may be desirable. Fourth, to employ, employ gold clauses even to the exclusion of contracts payable in Federal Reserve notes, and fifth, to enjoy permanent and untrammeled access to the gold and silver that are necessary for these purposes. Now, in constitutional analysis dealing with the state's authority over money, the key constitutional provision is Article 1, Section 10, Clause 1. That clause provides that no state shall coin money in the bills of gold and silver coin to tender payment of debt. So on the very face of the Constitution, the states may make gold and silver coin a tender of payment debts. And according to the principle that the Constitution must always be read with an eye towards fully achieving its purposes, the states should always make gold and silver coin a tender in payment of debts. Now, that authority to make anything but gold and silver coin a tender is drafted as an exception to the state's general disability to make tenders, that is, as an exception to an absence of power. But an exception to an absence of power is necessary the recognition of that power to the full extent of the exception. And the exception in favor of gold and silver coin knows no limitations in terms of the times at which it may be used, the circumstances in which it may be used, or the degree to which the states may apply it. So the states may and should make gold and silver coin a tender under all appropriate circumstances. And obviously an appropriate circumstance would be the near calamitous conditions that are prevailing in America today. Because the people would never have reserved that power to the states in the first place unless they intended the states to use it whenever it became necessary. Now except in one respect, the Constitution in no way limits the end of the state's authority to make gold and silver coin a tender with respect to the possible sources of the coin. The only gold and silver coin that is excluded from the state's power is the money which the states themselves might purport to coin, because Article 1, Section 10, Clause 1, as I said, prohibits any actual state coinage. Otherwise, where no exception is made in terms, none will be made by mere implication or construction. And therefore, the domestic coin that Congress causes to be minted, the foreign coin, the value of which Congress regulates, and even perhaps private coin, as long as they all consist of gold and silver, are all fit subjects for the state's power to make gold and silver coin a tender. The states may declare any and every domestic gold and silver coin a tender, in addition to any relevant declaration that Congress has put forth, because of course Congress has also declared uh, American gold and silver coins a tender. Uh, the states may declare any and every foreign gold and silver coin a tender, even when Congress refuses to do so. And conceivably, under the broad language of Article 1, Section 10, Clause 1, in extraordinary situations, the state might even declare any and every private gold.